Welcome back. It is time for Silver and Black today, a special Wednesday edition. Yes, we're, we're putting this out. We're recording it on Wednesday, so it's same day recording, same day release. Tomorrow is the 4th of July. We know we'd love for you to listen to the show. We figure you're going to be really busy tomorrow. So we wanted to come on and do the show for this Wednesday and wish you guys all a happy Independence Day. Enjoy your 4th of July. I use Independence Day more, Mo. And again, Mo is my partner here. He's my co-host he is a senior NFL writer at Bleacher Report, also the Raiders columnist at sportsnot.com, where you can catch my work today and most days is mostly video now, not as writing as much, but I'll do that as the Raiders start gearing up. But Mo, I call it Independence Day because I you know people say Fourth of July, and yes, we all say Fourth of July, but it's about independence. And so like I I always do it and know it's like an old guy thing, right? I want to remind people that why we're celebrating, right? And so I say Independence Day. So you walk around and say happy Independence Day instead of happy 4th of July. I do most of the time, at least on first reference. So almost like AP style, right? If I had my own style, it would be Independence Day on first reference. The writers out there understand that. Um, yes. And 4th of July on second reference would be acceptable in my guidebook. So there you go. But I hope everybody's enjoying it tomorrow and that you have fun. If you have to work. My my young one of my younger sons who's in high school is working tomorrow, and he's like, "Oh, I had to work on the Fourth of July." I said, "Yeah, welcome to the real world, pal." So he's going to do that, but uh, I hope everybody is going to have fun, and I know everybody will have good food and and do that. I got the smoker ready to go. I got all kinds of meat, Mo. I'm ready to to fire up the smoker. Although it's supposed to rain here in Cincinnati, so I I don't know how much I'll be. I can smoke in the rain. It's not a big deal. It's just you know less than ideal. Unless you're in Chicago. Don't forget to put ketchup on your glizzies oh. or hot dogs, whatever you want, whatever you call them tomorrow. If you're having a glizzy or hot dog, squirt that's, some ketchup on that bad boy. That's bad. That's one of the only pieces of bad advice Mo will ever give you. But <laughs> that's where we're at. But we're here to talk about Raiders football. And yes, it's it's slow, folks. There's nothing going on. There's a couple of things going on. And, but we're building up to training camp here in a couple weeks so it's right around the corner before you know it you will actually have real football and real quarterback battles and and battles for starting positions at cornerback on this Raiders team that's all going to come up here in the next few weeks and we can't wait for it too and we'll also go back to doing some more shows per week and we have a new sponsor coming on board we'll tell you about very very soon so we're excited about that but Mo you wrote a piece and, and this is the, the premise of the show today because you wrote a piece up on sportsnot.com. People can catch it. It's linked below in the description on both the podcast and on YouTube. By the way, subscribe to both. Subscribe to the audio podcast wherever you get your audio. And please rate it and uh, tell everybody how much you like the show. And then number two is if you're watching us on YouTube or Rumble or Facebook or X, like the video there. Subscribe to the channel. YouTube's the best experience. So if you can go up there and do that. Uh, we would certainly appreciate it. But Mo wrote this piece on sports, not about this. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about what Raiders, this is a projection, right? What Raiders, based on what we saw last year, based on what we've seen in the offseason, what Raiders are going to be better than they were last year? Who's going to be the most improved players on this roster? And, and I love this, Mo. It's a perfect kind of piece to talk to because you're you're piecing it together, right? We don't have anything, any any current play or camp or anything like that to talk about. But what we do have is what players made some bit of a jump last year, improved their performance, got more consistent. And so we're going to go in on this and, and your piece talks about it. And, and I couldn't disagree with the three people you picked. And, although I think there's a couple more I, I'm expecting to be better as well. But when we look at those three, let's start uh, a number one with, with your, your, the first player you mentioned in your piece and, and tell us who he is and tell us why you believe he'll be the most improved. Zamir White, most improved player, in my opinion, will be on Raiders roster will be Zamir White simply because he has the avenue to do it. He's going to be the starter. I know the Raiders signed Alexander Madison, but the departure of Josh Jacobs pretty much paves the way for Zamir White to be the guy. Now, we saw a little bit of that in the last four weeks of the previous season. I believe he averaged over 4.7 7 yards per carry. So I had my doubts about Zamir White because he didn't look anything special in the preseason and his spot duty. But when he has a high volume of touches, he's shown that he could be the guy and produce at an optimal level. So I, I think he'll be fine as the lead running back. Will Alexander Madison get some touches? Yes. Will Amir Abdullah or Dylan Alby get some touches? Absolutely. 
But Zamir White, to me, is a dark horse candidate to be within the top five in rushing yards this year, assuming that the Raiders uh, hand the ball because we know AP Styles, he wants to run the football. Now, he, he has kind of hinted at that at press conferences. Yeah. I get Devontae Adams is there, Jacoby Myers, Michael Mayer, they drafted Brock Bowers. You're hoping Aiden O'Connell takes a step of our new Minshew, uh, has a good season with the Raiders. But I don't think the Raiders are going to abandon the run game because that's what worked for them when their offense kind of was on shaky ground last year. You hope it's a little better in the passing game. But I don't think they get away from that because that's who AP is as a coach. He wants to impose, help his team impose its physical will on the opponent. Yeah, and I was talking to to a national uh, uh, NFL insider uh, in the last few days, and I'm not going to share the name because it was a private conversation. But but they told me that they told me that they had they had talked with the Raiders, some of the folks in the Raiders coaching staff, and one of the things they said was, "Yeah, we're going to run the ball, but don't overestimate the fact that we believe, especially with Aiden O'Connell, that we have a quarterback who can press the ball down the field." And we have the offensive weapons to do it. So I agree with you, though. I think that Zamir White, just purely because what we saw last year with increased reps, right? You talk about a running back and getting into the reps and getting into the rhythm. And I just think that he's made for that. And and Alexander Madison, I think, can play a good role. But I think he's going to play a role similar to what he did in Minnesota back in the day, where it was like, you're a 1B, and we're going to bring you in to spell Zamir White. And when you do, you're going to be fresh. You're going to be additive to this offense. And so to me, that one, two punch, and then we'll see the rest of the guys, how they fit in. But I, I agree with you, Mo. I think he's going to be very much improved. And the next player we'll talk about based on your list uh, is a reason why I think they'll run the ball. Well, they have Mumford jr. I know I had my doubts about him, but he filled in well last year on the right side, alternating with Jermaine Luminar and on the left side when Colton Miller got hurt. Based on what the Raiders did this offseason, it's clear that they have a lot of faith in Dan Mumford Jr. being the starter. They didn't draft an offensive tackle until the third round. Mind you, they waited until after they, they drafted a guard first in Jackson Powers Johnson, then drafted a tackle in DJ Glaze. DJ Glaze being a rookie who may have some position versatility is not much of a challenge to Dan Mumford at the right tackle spot. So Dan Mumford, you could pretty much pencil in to that starting spot there. Now he, again, played well in spot duty and fill-in duty. Now, as a full-time starter, you're expecting more out of him. I remember Vinny Bonsignor, our buddy at the Las Vegas Review-Journal, said the Raiders saw their Mumford, this is like two seasons ago, as a long-term starter at right tackle. And some people kind of dismissed it because he was a seventh rounder. But now you're starting to see that. And Tom Telesco, he took the job. He said that their Mumford is an interesting, intriguing player. So I think he has some, also he has some position versatility. If he doesn't work out at right tackle, he'll probably shift over to guard. But he's going to get the first crack to fill in at right tackle and be the long-term starter there. Right. And I, I think you look at this too with the 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 the, the zone blocking scheme with Luke Getsky Getsy and what's he's gonna what he's gonna do certainly uh puts it on. But I, I agree with you. I mean, th they're showing a lot of confidence in him. And remember, um he didn't have to Tom Telesco didn't have to be married to to Munford Jr. because he didn't draft mm -hmm. him, right? We talked about that many times on the show. It's like it's not a guy you drafted, so you're gonna look at him with a really critical eye, I believe. I think I think a, a, a talent. Uh, assessor is going to come in and do that and say, okay, I don't, I don't have any connection to this guy. I'm just going to look at him, evaluate him based on the film. And then what I see when he gets out to camp, it, but he obviously likes what he saw so much. So as you mentioned, they did something different in the, in the draft. So, so to me, that speaks very highly of, of what he's able to do. And, and I think that that offensive line, I think it's not as bad as people thought it was the last two years. I think it's been that way. And I think it's gotten better. And yes, it has spots. It's had injuries. It's had question marks. No question about that. You always want to get better. But I think that uh, I, I believe for this team to be successful and to put themselves in the position to get past that eight, nine win mark, if they can, is they got to have great offensive line play, especially with the quarterbacks they have. And so to me, that's going to be very important and agree with that um, that assessment that you made in the piece. The, the other thing really quick, Scott, is yep. he played on the left side those last four games. He didn't give up a sack in those right. last four games. Had, gave up five pressures in one game, I believe, against Miami, but didn't give up a sack in those last four games on the left side as a blind side tackle. So Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So it's going to be interesting, uh, and we'll watch it. All right, Mo, the third player you had on your list, and then I'll share with you maybe uh, one or two players that I think are going to be most, not most improved if you consider the three, but definitely there uh, around the top five. Tyree Wilson, it was more of the obvious choice there, simple because uh, top 10 pick, seventh overall last year, 
came off of a, a foot surgery last off season. We we both agree that he's going to have a slow start to the season, start to find his way midway through around the Miami Minnesota game, started to get some pressure, some sacks. Chicago, I believe he had his first sack in that game, but I think he's going to take a big leap even though he's not going to be the starter. And that leads me to my bigger point here it was interesting talking about Tyree Wilson because outside of his draft status, I don't think there's a lot of pressure on him coming into the season. I think that's going to help him simply because he's, again, he's not even projected to be the starter. Malcolm Kuntz, if we turn back the clock, Chandler Jones goes AWOL, the Raiders let him go, and we're wondering who's going to step up in that spot opposite Max Crosby. Turns out it was Malcolm Kuntz, and we're already talking about Maybe Malcolm Kuntz deserves an extension right now. So the spotlight right now is on Malcolm Kuntz. And, of course, Max Crosby is fantastic on the other side. But Tyree Wilson is going to be the third edge rusher. And he's not going to have the spotlight on him on every snap because he's not going to play the majority of the snaps on the edge. So I think that's good for him, having some of the spotlight off of him. And, of course, coming into this offseason fully healthy. Yeah, that's awesome. No, and I agree with you. And I think that if you look at the expectations. And I know somebody, I saw somebody post a picture of him at uh, the Max Crosby draft or not draft rushing camp, man, like he's, he's beefed up, which is good. As long as it doesn't interfere with his ability to, 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 to be agile, right at that position. But I do think that we'll see more out of him. And like you said, I think there's expectations for him, but I don't think Mm -hmm. this is like Cleveland Farrell where the second year you were expecting this massive jump, because really, he's only played, I would say, a half year uh, at full speed, and we saw him improve throughout the end of last season. So that'll be great. Um, I'm going to add a couple to your list, uh, and and I know people will love this, and I'm not just pandering, but I think we're going to see a lot of improvement out of Aiden O'Connell. I think we're going to see that because, number one, he's going to be, and we don't know about, the, we've talked about it, the jury's out on Luke Getze and the system and all that kind of stuff. We'll have to see how it works out. But I do think that if you look at where he started and what situation he was in last year, now he comes in, yes, he's learning a new offense, but I believe that with that improved offensive line, the things you're talking about now, with the running back who's going to be able to get it done, be able to take off some of that pressure, I think Aiden O'Connell at the end of the day will win the job, and I think he'll be improved. Is he going to be improved enough to get the Raiders to the playoffs? Don't know. But I do know I think we'll see him uh, be more consistent which will be a huge jump for him because that is one of the things that we didn't see last year was, was just some consistency and, and making sure that he's um, a guy who can go out there game in game out and deliver it, not have the kind of games like he had against Kansas city where you don't complete a pass past the second quarter right now, those things happen even to good quarterbacks occasionally, but I'm looking for the consistency and I'm looking for a little more accuracy. His decision-making is good and he's got to be smarter in the pocket. And I think he will. See, and I know that was what people were going to say. Mo, where's Aiden O'Connell? Why is he not on your list of most improved? I know that was going to be the biggest question there. The reason I didn't put Aiden O'Connell on the list is because we don't know if he's going to start. <laughs> no, 100%. I just, I just played, it, played it practically where, you know, the guys that I know are actually going to play. So, yeah, yeah. Tyree Wilson isn't going to start, but you can have three, four edge rushers playing every week. You're not going to have most quarterbacks play. So, uh, Start yet? Jeremy Wilson, training call. Wow, sorry about that. I know Mo, uh, your your signal is breaking up a little bit, buddy. So like we're getting like the robotic stuff coming in, but I think you're okay now. <laughs> if you of want to course. finish your point. Yeah, so I, I basically I just said I just left Aiden O'Connell all simply because we we don't I don't know we don't know if he's gonna start yet. And if he doesn't start, there's no way he can improve by watching Garden Mitchell throw passes on the field. Yeah, and the other guy I want to bring up quickly, and, and I agree with your top three, by the way. I have no changes to it myself. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm just bringing up a couple other players I think we're gonna see improvement out of, especially because of the situation. And the other guy, and people will be surprised by this, uh, although although I, I don't think, well, maybe they won't be surprised by it, but I think Michael Mayer is going to benefit from Brock Bowers being on this team because when they go out there in, in those sets and they have uh, Brock Bowers lined up, for example, in the slot or in the backfield as an H-back, whatever it may be, whatever they decide to come up with, I think Michael Mayer is going to get some get one-on-ones and he's going to be able to exploit some linebackers and whatnot. He's going to be able to, I think, get more opportunity because of of, of Brock Bowers being there and so I expect him to take a next level. I'm not talking about a massive explosion in, in numbers and touchdowns, but I'm talking about key catches for first downs, key completions that help them move the ball down the field. 
don't know if you remember this, Scott. Remember they he was asked about last year, and he didn't seem too thrilled to be in Josh McDaniel's offense. So I think just the fact that he's not in Josh McDaniel's offense is going to be a benefit <laughs> to him. And I pointed out this out weeks ago that if you look at Luke Gessie's offense and the way they use Cole Clement uh, over the last two years, Cole Clement had one of the biggest jumps outside of maybe DJ Moore and Luke Getzey's offense over the past couple of years. So Luke Getzey knows how to use his tight ends, and I expect him to work well with Michael Mayer and Brock Bowers. Absolutely. And Michael Mayer, too, not only did he start last season in that offense with that coaching staff, but then he also started with the quarterbacks he started with. So <laughs> we saw him obviously get better as the year went on. His blocking has gotten better, so I think he's one of those guys. But uh, but a lot, you know, I think this is going to be a very fun camp. It's going to be a great opportunity for fans to kind of get really excited about what this team can do. And frankly, no matter no matter whether you pick them having seven, eight wins, or you pick them having ten or eleven wins, uh, it, it's it's going to be really interesting to find out how this all unfolds. Uh, and it can be positive and it could be not positive. We'll see what happens. But I do think that the 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 feeling is amongst the staff, amongst the players, amongst the fan base, that this team is going to surprise people. And we'll have to see if that that does indeed happen. So it'll be good. All right. We're going to take our break. When we come back, we're going to get to your calls. It's going to be time for the Raider Nation mailbag. We got some calls and a couple texts. And we're going to roll through those here on this Wednesday edition of Silver and Black Today for this week. Don't forget, subscribe to the show, subscribe to the YouTube channel, wherever you may be. We appreciate that. Mo and I are coming right back after this. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back. It's time for your voice. Yes, the voice of the fan. It is time for the Raider Nation mailbag here on this edition of Silver and Black today. I'm Scott Colbranson, joined by my co-host, Mr. Mo Moten. He's a senior NFL writer at Bleacher Report. You can catch his Raiders work, too, up on SportsNot, N-A-U-T, that is, like astronaut, but SportsNot.com where he is a Raiders columnist. You can also catch my work up on sportsnot.com. Appreciate it. Make sure you subscribe wherever you get your audio and your video. Okay, man, we got some calls. We got usual suspects because, you know, during this time, I was talking about it in the first segment, it's just slower. So I don't blame fans for not being as checked in and we don't hear from as many people and that kind of stuff. Like, I get it because, like, this is a – before camp starts, you kind of have a little break – just like you, you had a break last week. You have a little break, and you're able to kind of not worry about your Raiders for a while, and then you can come back to it when they're in camp, and it starts to mean something. So I get that. And uh, so we got calls, and we got some text messages. We get that. So we got some usual suspects on this edition. A couple, a couple of people who've called in before, and could people who call in every week. We have our serial callers, which I like: Jacob from Fresno, uh, Reverend Mike from Behind Bars. All Tarek. this kind of stuff. So we have, we have and Tarek, of course, every week. So we have some good stuff here, and we're going to get to that. Remember, if you want to call in for our next show, do so. You can call in. The number is 700, 700, 702, we're close to 700, 702, 900. There we go. 702, 900, 7869. That's 702, 900, 7869. Leave your name, where you're calling from, and then your message or comment, whatever it may be, and we'll put it on the air here. Yes, we will get you on the show. So make sure you do that. All right. Our first call, I got to bring up my notes here so I know who that guy I'm talking to, uh, is Anders from Oakland. One of those guys who calls in, maybe not every week, but he calls in regularly. So we'll, uh, we appreciate him and we'll appreciate his comments. So here's Anders from Oakland. Uh, hey, fellas. Uh, it's Anders again from Oakland. So let's try this again. It's been a while. Anyway, <laughs> bear with me here for a second. We're going to talk quarterbacks. Mm. In the last 10 years, what do Aaron Rodgers, Trevor Lawrence, Justin Herbert, Dak Prescott, Lamar Jackson, Kyler Murray, Josh Allen, Deshaun Watson, Kirk Cousins, Tua, Joe Burrow, Jordan Love, Jalen Hurts, Baker Mayfield, Sam Darnold, Josh Rosen, Jared Goff, Carson Wentz, James Winston, Marcus Mariota, Johnny Manziel, Teddy Bridgewater, Andrew Luck, RJ3, <laughs> Ryan Tannehill, Cam Newton, Sam Bradford, and Tim Tebow all have in common. They are or were considered franchise quarterbacks. And you know what else they have in common? Zero Super Bowl wins. And what do Stafford and Foles have in common? Super Bowl wins. It's just way too simplistic to claim you have to have a franchise quarterback as the only route to win. This list, I think, proves it's a lot more than that. This game is really, really hard. And 
stripping it down to just having the right QB is myopic. And even if you do find that franchise quarterback, one of the ones perhaps listed earlier, you still face a monumental challenge if you think that the only way to beat the Chiefs, for example, is to have a QB that can match or come close to match Mahomes. Uh, good luck with that. You just can't out Mahomes Mahomes. you you, you got to take a different route. How can we beat them in a different way? And all you guys are saying, we got to have a quarterback that can match them. we got to have a quarterback. we got to have a quarterback. Well, if all of those superstar quarterbacks that I just listed couldn't win a Super Bowl, could there be a different path? I think so. We beat Mahomes with a quarterback that didn't complete a pass over the last three quarters. So you got to find a way to change the terms of the game. You can't play it on his or Andy Reid's terms. You're going to lose every time. You got to chase him. You got to have him run for his life. And I think that's what we're doing. We're going to focus on beating the living crap out of these superstar QBs. And as far as I know, it's the only thing that's worked. Um, and frankly, that's how Eli's teams beat Brady's teams, by the way. And we can all agree that Eli was far inferior to Brady. So to me, to just say you can't do it without this superstar QB, well, there are a lot of superstar QBs that are out there and they haven't done it with those guys. I'm saying just go after them and take the initiative and just all right, there it ended right there. Anders was going long. But, hey, man, we appreciate the call. Some really interesting things he brings up here because his point in naming all those quarterbacks, and he went through all of them exhaustively, I get what he's saying with that point. And I do agree that, no, you don't just get a franchise quarterback and you win a Super Bowl. Like, we've seen it. We've seen it uh, uh, throughout the league. You have to have complementary football, to his point. You got to play defense. You don't just beat the Chiefs because you have a better quarterback than Patrick Mahomes because there's, as his point made, there isn't one. But if you look again at the Super Bowls over the last 10 years, the same period he's talking about, a lot of the same guys won the Super Bowl. And if those teams don't have that quarterback, I don't think they win it. Now, in the case of the Raiders, Mo, too, especially, I think that it's not just, hey, if you get a franchise quarterback, you win the Super Bowl. By the way, Mentioned Joe Burrow. Joe Burrow's been to two AFC championship games in four years, and he went to the Super Bowl once. He didn't win it, granted, but I think Anders was leaving out there, too, that a lot of those guys have Super, Super Bowl um, appearances, and they have playoff wins. you got to get in the playoffs to even get to the Super Bowl. So, yes, but, but he brings up a good point, too, about the names that didn't work out. No question about it. We talk about that a lot on the show, but I do think in today's league – you have to have all the pieces together, right? You got to have the offense and defensive line. You got to have good units on both sides and skilled players. But to me, even though I don't disagree with a lot of what he said, I still think you have to have somebody who's going to at least get you to the stage where if they need to win you a game, they can do it. I think there are two different conversations being had here. So I'm just talking about winning a Super Bowl. And if you look at the last two decades, most of the Super Bowls are won by – two teams <laughs> the patriots with tom and brady in kansas city with the Pat with patrick mahomes right so it's hard to even kind of look at the last two decades because you had two superstar quarterbacks leading you know, basically leading dominated teams to super bowl wins two dynasties basically one for one to a, a looks like another happening in kansas city so I, I think for me wanting a franchise quarterback one when do you identify a quarterback as a franchise quarterback? I don't think being drafted in the top 10 makes a franchise quarterback. You mentioned Josh Rosen. I don't think Josh Rosen should ever be considered a franchise quarterback because he didn't do anything to prove he was one. Right. Now, if or you James want to talk Winston. about – Or James Winston. Now, if you want to yeah. talk about Lamar Jackson, yeah. franchise quarterback. I, I believe he fits into that mold. Joe Burrow had you know, his appearances in a place when healthy, franchise quarterback. Those guys have proved that they're franchise quarterbacks. Now, ne neither of them have Super Bowl wins. But what it does give you when you have a franchise quarterback is consistency. So you you my point is you want the franchise quarterback, quote unquote, because you want that consistency to be a competitor year in and year out. Yeah. You know, if you just go to the playoffs one year, you don't make it back the next year, which the Reds have done since 2016 twice in 2016 and 2021. You don't have that consistency. Now, they had Derek Carr, who was the consistent uh, piece at quarterback. But if you have an upper echelon quarterback like Lamar Jackson, there's a good chance that you're going to be a perennial playoff contender for the long term. You're not just playing 
to make the playoffs for one season, you're trying to sustain your success mm -hmm. because you want AP to stay as your head coach. You want to keep that same coaching staff. You want to keep a lot of your pieces together and you want that consistency. And that's what a franchise quarterback in a lot of cases will get you. And I'll I mean, look, Derek Carr was a franchise quarterback. Is there any yes. question that he was? Whether you like him or yes. not, he was a franchise quarterback. Had the Raiders had better pieces around him, could he have taken? I know we always said this, even when, when Derek Carr was basically getting run out of town. I've always said that if he had everything around him, he could easily go to the Super Bowl and win the Super Bowl for the Raiders. He was good enough to do that. So maybe that put, plays up a little bit of, of Honor's point. Although Derek Carr, again, he was a franchise quarterback. He might not have been picked in the top 10. And that's the other thing, too. I'm not saying when I talk about the Raiders finding a franchise quarterback, doesn't mean he has to be picked in the top 10, right? It, 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 I mean, look at Patrick Mahomes. He was 10th, right? So he was right there on the – he wasn't picked overall in the top five, and even though the Chiefs moved up to get him. So I'm not saying the franchise quarterback has to be top five or even top 10. You could get somebody at 15 or 20. You never know. Depends on who it is and how it all works out. But it's a fair point. I think you can, just like anything else in this world, unders, and I know you know this because you're a smart guy, you can find anything to bolster arguments on both sides, right? Hey, that you need to do this, that you need to do that. Because there's great examples of guys and, and winners who were picked in the first round and did incredibly well, including winning Super Bowls. And then there's guys like Tom Brady, and there's guys who went in the third round and the second round, like Joe Montana, who won Super Bowls too and are considered some of the best players ever. So to that point, I think that you can find it anywhere you look. I, I will say this to Honors, and he made – don't get me wrong. Honors made some great points. Great right? point. And, no. and, and, no. and I want to say that just to preface this, that he made some great points. And – in any given season, a team without a franchise quarterback can make the playoffs and even make it to the Super Bowl and possibly win it, depending on how things shake out. There are so many variables with injuries and trades that happen. But again, yep. you want to be able to sustain being a perennial playoff contender. And if you look at the teams that are in the playoffs year in and year out, the Ravens, yes. the Philadelphia Eagles, the Rams, and Stafford has gotten there. They have guys who are considered franchise quarterbacks. Correct. And I mean, you look at and Matthew Stafford, too, is a great example because Matthew Stafford was considered that guy coming out of college, right? Coming out of Georgia, he goes to the Lions and we know how bad the Lions were a lot of the times he was there. But when he got to the Rams, um, he's a franchise quarterback. They traded for him. They gave up a lot for him. But he joined a team that was stocked. I mean, you had Aaron Donald, you had all those guys on that Rams team that won the Super Bowl. And when you look at that, you say, OK, so could somebody else of lesser talent come in and won with that Rams team? Maybe, because you look at his predecessor was there too. Goff was in the Super Bowl, didn't win it, but he was in it, and, and you saw him lead the team there. So it, it is, there's nuances there. So yes, sometimes we say things to Anders, I think here, like I will say, and I've repeated many times, that I don't believe at this point in time that Aiden O'Connell is a franchise quarterback. Um, that does not mean that he doesn't prove me wrong. I mean, not everything's not black and white. We have opinions, and a lot of times they're wrong, and a lot of times they're right. So we'll see, uh, and we'll figure it out. But I think the Raiders, they'll get some answers this year with Aiden O'Connell. And if they're answers they love, then they'll stick with him if he wins out the job, by the way. And if they don't, then they'll start looking for a quarterback next year. So it'll be interesting. All right, Anders, thanks for the call, man. We appreciate it. All right, next we are going to our good buddy. Get ready for your eardrums to be burst. It is Jacob from Fresno. Jacob, go on, man. Yeah. Gilly, gilly, go, Glenn Sane. And midi, 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 down, mo, mo, tin. This is Jacob from Fresno. What's up, guys? I'm a little low energy this week. I went to the ER for uh -oh. nothing serious. Wasn't anything life-threatening or anything like that, but I'm very tired. So that's all just to say that. I'm good. Don't even worry. I'm good. It's an ear infection. I'll just say it. That's what it was. <laughs> it was horrible. Awful. Unlike this season. This season's going to be great. We're going to be on top of it. But I got a couple scenarios for you. I want to run down the possibilities of this season, particularly at the position of quarterback. Hmm. As per usual, my friends, we are talking about quarterback this week. We got Aiden O'Connell and Gardner Minshew coming at it, you know, with, with a real true solid quarterback competition, the likes of which we haven't seen since, uh, 
I don't know, Carson Palmer, or Jason Campbell. No, I think mean, Campbell was hurt. So I, I don't, I can't think of a time we had this kind of battle. But, uh, I want to run through some scenarios with you. At what point would we say we start with Aiden O'Connell? What does he do that warrants being taken out? Is he, does it, is it all about looks? Are we looking at it like, you know, it just has to look a certain way? Or is it to a point where, I mean, he looks like he's playing pretty good, but we, we've lost the first four. What are we going to do about this? We've lost the first six, but he's doing good. He's throwing three touchdowns a game. At that point, is it just, you know, we, we go with, you know, playing the next card, seeing whatever works or, you know, with that regard, what does Aiden O'Connell do to lose the job if he's the starter? And secondly, if Aiden O'Connell and Gardner Minshew are not the guy, and it's very, uh, it's very evident by that midpoint of the season, what are the things that we can do? Do we go out and get a free agent like Ryan Tannehill, or do we just put all our chips in on going in the draft next year? You guys let me know. You take it easy. Appreciate everything you do. Go Raiders. <laughs> there you go, Jacob and Fresno. Mo, what do you think? So I, I, I took some notes here. The easiest way yeah. for any quarterback to lose their job, turning the ball over. Turn we saw that. I brought up Matthew Stafford with, with the and the reason why one of the main reasons why he's he was turning the ball over a lot before they traded him to Detroit. Mm-hmm. Now he had a resurgence in Detroit in Detroit, and now Matthew Stafford's there. Matthew Stafford turns the ball over a bit, but he makes a lot more plays. So turnover is number one. If Aiden O'Connell comes in the first two, three weeks and he has eight, nine turnovers between fumbles and interceptions, he's gonna get benched. Easy as that. The other thing is, and you kind of mentioned it, Jacob, is it would have to be losses plus bad performances. So if the Raiders are losing, but Aiden O'Connell's throwing for three touchdowns, no reason to pull him because obviously he's not the problem. It's it's it would be the defense, which would surprise a lot of us because we're expecting the defense to be top five, top ten. But if he's throwing well and the defense is just giving up a ton of points, that's not his fault. He you know you keep him out there and hope that the defense finds its way again. But it has to be losses plus poor performances. So if the Raiders are losing and they're only scoring fourteen points a game. Then it's probably because your 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 quarterback, your passing game, your offense in general isn't performing well. Now some of that some of that is going to go to Luke Getzey, but you're going to be looking at the quarterback position because we know how it works. When the offense is playing well, the quarterback gets the lion's share of the credit. When the offense All is the not credit. playing well, the first thing you look at how is the quarterback playing, and if he's not playing well, you're going to probably bench him. Now the other thing about what Jacob says: What do Raiders do mid-season if things are not going well? Do they sign around Ryan Tannehill if he's available? Or they go after another backup. It all depends on the Raiders' record. If the Raiders are two and six by midseason, there's no point in trying to go out and get a Ryan Tannehill. Just ride it out, get the top five draft pick, and then draft a quarterback very high in 2025. Now, if you're four and four, four and five, somewhere around 500, and you think you can make a run for the playoffs, then you go out and see who's available at quarterback. Yeah, I agree with that 100. percent And I, I, it, it, it's always tough because you can. It depends on, to, to his point too, I mean, and I know we're getting to a negative here about, well, what if something goes wrong? But uh, to me, it's also a nuanced feel, like why, to your point, turnovers, no question about it, right? But then is the offense out of sync? Is the quarterback not um, leading the offense? Is he missing passes, right? Or just not throwing the ball well. You right. see that, but to your point, he could be doing well, they're moving the offense, and they're unable to score in the in the red zone. Okay, is that the quarterback's fault? Is it the the play call? Is it a situation with the offense and Luke Getze? So there's all those nuanced pieces, and then you add it in the defense, which is a good one too. So I think, Jacob, that you you don't know until you see it, right? And then you start having the discussion by saying, hmm, okay, everything else is going well, but he's not accurate with the football, or he's throwing it long, he's throwing it short, or he's turning the football over, or, man, he moves the ball down the field, and then they get to the red zone, and they can't call a play to save their life. That's not really his fault. So why would you switch the quarterback? That's that's a coaching issue. So we'll set, we'll have to see. And I think that that's what will happen um, is that you have to see a multitude of those things happen before you do it. And and whatever the quarterback's responsible for, they'll make them own up to it. And if they need to make a change, they'll make a change. But hopefully, whoever it is starting a quarterback doesn't have that issue. So the other thing we didn't mention is let's say the offensive line is not playing well and they're going to need a quarterback who can move a little bit more, and Aiden O'Connell's taking a lot of hits in the pocket. That would be another reason why you would switch to Gardner Minshew. While Gardner Minshew isn't Josh Allen out there, 
he's a, he's more mobile than Aiden O'Connell. And they, if, if the offensive line is struggling and you can't get the run game going, you need a little more movement out of the quarterback position. You may think about a switch if Aiden O'Connell is not playing well and getting hit a ton in the pocket. Yes, 100%. All right, Jacob, thanks as always, my man. All right, now we go to Kenny down in Long Beach, California. Here's Kenny. Hey, Scott. Hey, Mo. This is Kenny Meltzer from Long Beach, California. Thank you for taking my call. I actually left a voicemail earlier today, but uh, <laughs> kind of wanted to unsend that. And uh, But there's no such thing as that with the voicemail, so here we are. Anyway, I got you. Uh, great stuff. I love the top five Raider QBs you guys pick. My list is basically the same, so I won't dabble in that. A couple things I want to bring up. Uh, Devontae Adams, why are people so fixated on still trading him? It doesn't make sense. He's still <laughs> an elite wide receiver. And I believe he's the heart and soul of the offense now that Josh Jacobs is gone. But people still want to get rid of him. It doesn't make sense. You, know, people, you get people being like, oh, he old or, or, or he, he, he's going to get a big cap hit next year. We need to get rid of him or let's trade for Brandon Ayuk. It's like, why would we trade for him? He, he we'll have to give up assets and pay him also. It does not make sense. No, Devontae's not going anywhere. Let's keep him. But, yeah, why, why, why are people like that? <laughs> also, uh, team rankings. Um, I know they're meaningless. They don't, you know, there's just based off opinions, but for the sake of discussion, I saw JT the Brick repost something from X.com with Pro Football Talk. They had the Chiefs obviously at one, but then they had the Chargers at 15, Broncos at 22, and the Raiders at 26. Like, what's up with that? Chiefs, uh, Chargers are always overhyped. They got um, Wonder Boy. Justin Herbert and 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 uh, Jim Harbaugh, the winner. But who else they got on offense? Nobody. And their defense, like AOC, scored four touchdowns against them. Let's let's stop with that. And and even though they got guys like Mac or Bosa, Bosa's like the Mike Trout of the NFL. He's always getting hurt with all that talent he got. He can't even finish a season. So catch me with that. And then the Broncos, they have all they they have just as much questions on. At, quarterback as the Raiders if not worse but yeah let's rank them higher than the Raiders anyways even though they've never beaten the Las Vegas Raiders so yeah why, why what's up with the media like that is that just uh, a Raider <laughs> hate thing I know like um, they have questions at quarterback but still they got better on defense they got Christian, Christian Wilkins they got Brock Bowers on offense this, this team should be I believe they should be better next, this upcoming season based on how AOC or Barner Minshew do uh, let me know what you guys think. Um, and yeah, uh, go Raiders. There we go. Kenny down in Long Beach. And Mo, I, listen, I, there's one thing I would say to you, Kenny, is I, I know the word gets used, Raider hate. I don't think it's hate. I think it's a lack of respect because the media outside, and, and Mo, you always mention this, people who don't cover the Raiders every day, they look at the situation and they say, okay, rookie head coach, no matter how much you like Antonio Pierce, it's just, and and people are very high on Antonio Pierce. They're just unsure of how he's going to do. They just don't know yet. It's an unknown, right? They're not saying he's going to do bad. They just don't know. Number two is the quarterback situation, absolutely. And Denver's quarterback situation is worse, but Sean Payton's the coach. So they're betting on the coach there. And I agree. I think that I don't think there's any way the Broncos will be better than the Raiders. That's just my view. But to your point, I think that that when you look at it from that perspective, from the outside, again, you look at what's happened with the Raiders, the lack of consistency in the front office with coaching staff, quarterback, they haven't been able to figure it out since Carr left. And so you look at that and you say, well, I just can't put my faith in it. I think, and I'm not trying to make excuces for the people who are anti-Raider, if you will, because I, th I think there are a few, but not very, not, not a huge amount. And so when you look at that, then you say to yourself, okay, yeah, if I look in the division, and again, you're looking at the division through the lens of a fan, which is which is what you are, so you need to look at the through the lens of a fan. But I think, again, you look at Harbaugh and the Chargers. I agree with you. I think the Raiders will be better than the Chargers this year, but you got Harbaugh and you have the quarterback. So they're instantly going to, and they've been in love with the Chargers, even though they never do anything uh, for a long time. So, so I agree with that assessment. But Mo, when you think about uh, the the points Kenny brought up about this Raider team and where people think they are, uh, explain what you think the reasoning behind it is. All right, if my summertime connection allows me to do it, Kenny, <laughs> pull up a seat and I'll explain to you why this is going on with the Raiders. And I'm I'm giving this insight to you through as a as a national writer also. So I know how national writers think when they put together these pieces, or national pundits think when they put together these pieces. 
the Raiders have been an inconsistent team for the past, what, you know, two decades, <laughs> you know, so it's it, a lot of it is. And I, and Scott mentioned it. A lot of people don't follow the Raiders year to year, week to week, even in the media business. So they're looking at the Raiders as a inconsistent team in the past two decades. They're going to continue to be inconsistent until they find a star quarterback. That's just how a lot of national writers think. Now, getting to the quarterback position, I, I understand why the Chargers, even though they're overhyped seemingly every offseason, why the Chargers are ahead of the Raiders. And I have the Chargers and the Raiders both hovering around 500. But if you look at Jim Harbaugh's resume, over 70% win percentage as a college and pro coach. And then you got Justin Herbert. Whether you, I know I understand a lot of Raider fans believe he's underrated, but he, he is an established quarterback in this league, and they're going to give the Chargers the benefit of the, of the doubt when the Chargers have their quarterback in place and you got a head coach who's won everywhere he's gone. I'm going to repeat that. Jim Harbaugh has won everywhere he's gone, so he's going to get the benefit of the doubt again, despite what the Chargers' history says about them being overrated. The Broncos, I don't understand from a writer perspective, but I understand if you don't follow the game. And I'll explain why. The Broncos obviously have questions like the Raiders do and have, to me, have more questions because they have questions on both sides of the ball because their defense wasn't that good last year either. But as you said, they have Sean Payton, who's won a Super Bowl again. It was with Drew Brees, who's a Hall of Fame type quarterback. But they also drafted a first a quarterback in the first round. So a quarterback drafted in the first round is going to get the benefit of the doubt over Aiden O'Connell, who was drafted in the fourth round. That's mm-hmm. just how writers think. Okay, guy gets drafted in the first round. He's expected to be better than the guy who was drafted in the fourth round. That's just how it goes. And on top of that, as I said, that first round quarterback is paired with a with a with this uh, head coach who won a Super Bowl, Antonio Pierce. As we said, this is going to be his first full season as a head coach, and he's got a fourth round quarterback or a guy who's been a spot starter or a backup. So Bo Nix is going to get the benefit of the doubt over Aiden O'Connell. The other thing is Bo Nix is beginning a lot of buzz, and I know this because I'm an, again I'm a national writer, so I've been paying attention to what's been going on out of camp. Tashawn Reed and the Athletic have said the Raiders quarterback competition hasn't really picked up. Both guys kind of struggled through mandatory minicamp. Over in Denver, there's a lot of positive press coming out about Bo Nix and how he's mm-hmm. taking on the offense, and he's he, yeah. he's ahead of most rookie quarterbacks because he spent so much time in college. He has all that collegiate experience. They're saying that he's a lot further along than the average rookie quarterback. So that's where the Bo Nix buzz is coming from in Denver. But I agree with, with, with you, Kenny. I don't think Denver should be ranked ahead of the Raiders simply because – one, they haven't beaten the Raiders <laughs> since they got to Las Vegas. And yep. two, they have they still have so many question marks that how can you put faith in that even with a first-round quarterback and a Super Bowl-winning head coach? I'd have Denver probably at 26 and the Raiders higher. But I understand why the Chargers are higher because, again, Jim Harbaugh's resume boosts that team up on the rankings. Right, yeah, exactly. And, and it goes back to name recognition and, and history, like you said, winning yeah. winning coach. Uh, all right. Thanks for the the call, Kenny. We're going to get to one of our text messages now, uh, and I will read this one. It's from Raider Rich out in California. He says, love the show. You guys are spot on with the quarterback position, in my opinion. I pray they prove you guys wrong and AOC balls out. I believe not only will the defense have a top five, but a top three defense. If they get average QB play, then they could win 10 games. I don't disagree. Getze is the big question mark. If he can get Bowers and Mayer the ball and establish a running game, it takes a lot of pressure off AOC or Minshew. There is hope for us hardcore fans, though. I've been in an abusive relationship with the Raiders since 1986. They keep promising me uh, they will not break my heart, but continue to. But I believe this is the year we turn it around. That's Raider Rich out in California. Uh, good call there, too. And it goes back. He's, he says exactly what we say, Mo, which is, can Getsy get this thing going? Can they do uh, what they need to do? So even if the quarterbacks aren't, the best quarterbacks in the league, they're able to perform in the offense well enough, and the defense buoys this team so that they can get uh, get f- more than eight or nine wins. Yeah, absolutely. And we, it goes back to Anders' call, and I think Anders' call, was, again, was a very good call. Mm-hmm. Any team in any given season can win 10-plus games, even with a, a shaky quarterback situation. You know, the Pittsburgh Steelers made the quarterback – uh, made the playoffs last year and they ended with their starting quarterback as Mason Rudolph because they had because they moved on from Kenny Pickett. Uh Cleveland yeah. Browns, Deshaun Watson was hurt for basically half the season. They wound up in the playoffs with Joe Flacco. So we've seen teams make it to the playoffs with a quarterback that either didn't start the season or was a, 
was a backup or coming off of his couch as Joe Flacco was. But for me, I, what I want to see from the Raiders, and as a fan growing up with the Raiders, I want to see consistency. Because I didn't see much of that as, as a young Raider fan. Now, I, yeah. I, 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 I watched the Rich Gannon years closely. We talked about that in our last show when we ranked our quarterbacks. Rich Gannon was the last quarterback I watched where I understood the game. Hostel was the quarterback I first watched with yeah. the Raiders. But I haven't seen that consistency from the Raiders since the early 2000s. Yeah. So I, I'm hoping that we're wrong and that Aiden O'Connell and Gardner Minshew, you know, is at least serviceable because then they can get the Raiders, you know, consistently to the playoffs with this defense that they have, as 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 Raider Rich points out, that could be top three in my in my opinion as well, could be top of the league with that defensive line and Jack Jones on the back end. You don't need a spectacular quarterback. You don't need a Hall of Fame caliber quarterback. You don't need an all pro or pro bowl caliber quarterback with that defense. You just mm-hmm. need a decent core. You just need decent quarterback play to get you through this year. Now, again, for the big picture, I hope Raider Rich, you said this from 1986, the year I was born. I want to see Raider consistency. <laughs> I want to see the Raiders be a perennial playoff contender again as they were in the Rich Gannon years because that will stop all of this, as Kenny talked about in his call, the Raider hate that you see. Yeah. If the Raiders start making the playoffs consistently, making the playoffs two years in a row, three years in a row, four years years in a row, you won't see – then you won't see the Raiders rank 26, 27, 28th in the league because they're like, oh, the Raiders finally turned it around as Raider Rich wants to see as I want to see you know, as a person growing up as a fan of the franchise. So we'll 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 see what Aiden O'Connell or Gardner Minshew bring to the table. It could happen, you know, in one year. It could be good. But I'm hoping that for a stretch of time we see the Raiders back in the playoffs consistently. Would be nice for everybody involved. Uh, thanks for the call. We appreciate it. Uh, and uh, we're going to get, or I should say, the text. That was a text message, so we appreciate it. You can text us or call us, 702-900-7869, 702-900-7869, and we will get you on next week's show. All right, the last call of the day is from Pastor Mike. Here's Pastor Mike behind bars. Hey, Scott Mo, Pastor Mike behind bars on this beautiful, hot day in eastern Oregon. <laughs> Um, just wanted to call and, and make a comment of your last show about um, the top five quarterbacks. Scott, I agree with you. It's definitely number five. I'd put Carr there for sure. Um, and I'm an old guy. I've been watching the Raiders since the early 70s. Um, so Carr and then Gannon and then um, Plunkett. LaMonica, and Stabler. Kenny Stabler is the whole reason I became a a Raider fan, (laughs) to be honest with you. And I have seen – I've seen all those guys play. Um, I've seen um, three or four of them play live. So that, you know, in the stadium. So, yeah, I I would definitely agree. But, you know, Raider fans never say die. And I can tell you this. From watching Kenny Stabler, with one minute left, he can score twice. (laughs) How he does it, I don't know. But it, but to me, it was always like, no matter what, the whole time I've been a Raider fan, if they were behind by two touchdowns in the fourth quarter with maybe five minutes left, I'm thinking, oh, yeah, absolutely. Maybe even three touchdowns. And they're, yeah, oh, yeah, five minutes left, no problem. Yeah, we can score three touchdowns in five minutes, you know. And so, um, and as far as being an old guy and liking Derek Carr, I do have to say that, I've been a season ticket holder the whole time that Derek Carr was a quarterback, and he brought some some of the most exciting games, um, even though we were hardly ever in the playoff hunt when he was the quarterback. But there were games that I went to live that were just very exciting, um, and that he would brought them back. Like, you know, the one that comes to mind to me the most is uh, against the Kansas City Chiefs and um, in 20, I think it was 2017 with the three untimed downs. I was at that game and just, yeah, I was just losing my mind. It was, it was awesome. So I do have to say with Derek that, um, that he, uh, he brought, you know, he brought some great, exciting, you know, comebacks, you know, and then, then he laid some eggs as well, you know, which, you know, um, you, you, I guess you take the good with the bad, right? <laughs> but anyway, I, I just wanted to kind of put my two cents in there and, um, and say I'm looking forward to this year. Um, I'm, you know, hoping that Getsy, you know, can get this offense rolling and, and we'll see what happens in our quarterback room. And, and, you know, and if it all turns, you know, upside down, then, 
then, hey, we get, you know, we go after a quarterback next year, I guess. But um, anyway, I, I really enjoy your show. Appreciate you putting me on when you do. And I hope you guys have a great day. And we will talk to you soon. All right. Ray. <laughs> There's Pastor Mike doing the Lord's work behind bars. Thanks for the call, man. And you know what? He brought up a good point there, Mo, which was about saying that when he watched Ken Stabler, and again, Ken Stabler's a Hall of Famer. Ken Stabler, it, it could be three minutes, five minutes in a game, and they're down by two or three scores. And, and you had hope that he could go down and do it. And he did it a few times, right? And I think that's when, because when people ask us, well, what's a franchise quarterback? That's a franchise quarterback, right? It doesn't matter where they're drafted, who they are, whatever. But if there's somebody who can take the team on their shoulders and lead you to victory, now it takes time and experience to do that, clearly. But but I think that, that that's what you look for in a quarterback. I don't care if he's first round or fourth round. That's that's what you need a guy to do. You need a guy to elevate everyone else around him. And again, I'm going to snack a broken record, but this goes back to Andres Cole again about the franchise quarterback. Your franchise quarterback may not lead you to a Super Bowl, but he gives you a chance to win one. Exactly. And I go back to Baltimore with Lamar Jackson, Buffalo with Josh Allen, Dallas with Dak Prescott, Joe Burrow with Cincinnati. You know, where were those teams before those quarterbacks showed up? You know, where you know now Dallas with Tony Romo, they were, you know, playoff contender, but the Buffalo Bills weren't winning division titles before Josh Allen got there. Now the, the Baltimore Warriors won a Super Bowl with, with Joe Flacco, but he was on the way out. And, and Lamar Jackson basically saved John Harbaugh's job in Baltimore. Yeah. He got that team back into the you know, back into the playoff hunt, back on the main stage. So you, you need that franchise quarterback again for consistency. You don't necessarily need one for you know, a one-off season where you can get by with multiple quarterbacks, but for that consistency, for that longevity of being a perennial playoff contender to be in the hunt year in and year out, you need some stability at the quarterback position in today's league. Yep. No doubt about it. Uh, and I think that that is, that's the whole point, right? Is you have to, you have to find that. And, and if your team's great around the quarterback, even better. If your team's a little lackluster in certain areas and you have a guy who can elevate everybody around him, you seem to see that. I mean, look what happened in Houston with CJ Stroud. He was a rookie. I know he had crazy, crazy numbers and all that, but look what happened. They put the quarterback in there and they had Deshaun Watson when he had that great year, even though they had two wins, he still had a great year. It didn't mean anything because they didn't have anything else around him. So there's always a mix, right? It's a team game. You have to have that, but having that consistency is so key. Pastor Mike, thanks for the call. And thanks to everybody for calling in this week and sending your text. Uh, and we will get to all of them when we can. So thank you for doing that. If you want to do it, remember 702-900-7869 is the number. So do that. Mo, anything you want to tell people about uh, you got going uh, the rest of this week? Obviously, tomorrow is the 4th of July. It's Independence Day. You're going to hang out and have a good time. But anything you want people to uh, to look out for? I'll be putting ketchup on my glizzies Thursday. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> That's right. So, and like I said, if you're not out barbecuing <laughs> or having fun on the 4th of July, uh, go over on Sports Not. Check out the piece that I put up. My three most improved Raiders for the 2024 season. We talked about it today. It's explained in detail over on the website. I will have a Bleach Report live July 25th. So, two weeks. Mm. About, about three weeks away from that Bleach Report live. Camp for the Raiders opening in about two weeks, the 19th, where the rookies report, the 21st, where the veterans will join them. So we're getting closer, Sky. We're inching a little yes. closer to so very close. some semblance of football, and we're ready. Can't wait. Absolutely. I uh, look forward to that, so make sure you check it out, and we'll remind you next show. We'll be back. Uh, we've got a couple more weeks here where we're just doing the one show a week, unless news pops up or if, if Mo and I just have something we want to say, and then we end up popping out a short show or something. But otherwise, we'll be back next week. Uh, most likely on our Tuesday, usually. See, summer, we're even a little inconsistent with the day, but that's okay. We wanted to get you this show before the holiday, so you have something to listen to. If you want to tune out some of those relatives that might be a little too loud for you or whatever. <laughs> there you go. But anyway, enjoy it. Uh, please have a great, uh, safe and sane Independence Day, 4th of July. Make sure if you're going to have a drink, I know I am. If you're going to have a drink, don't drive. Please don't drive. Uh, find a way. There's too many easy ways to do that. Don't go out and kill yourself or others. And we appreciate that very much. For our producer, Mike Robbie, a former moat, and I'm Scott Branson. This has been Silver and Black Today. We'll talk to you next week.